my name is Sharon John, and I'm a member of the class of 1994, and I just wanted to say how incredible, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of love today, so uh, all for that. It's really an incredible pleasure to introduce this session to you. I'm beyond honored, and it's wonderful, too, to look out among this crowd and see so many old friends and, and reigniting some old acquaintances, like I'm sure many of you are doing um, at, uh, at, during this weekend's uh, experiences and events. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce this keynote session, The Future of Globalization, I am delighted, very delighted, <laughs> to welcome Joseph Stiglitz, the executive director and co-founder of the Initiative for Policy Dialogue and university professor of finance and economics, a, recent, uh, a recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics Science for in 2001. Professor Stiglitz is a former senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank and a former member and chairman of the U.S. President's Council of Economic Advisors. He is the author of several bestsellers, including Globalization and Its Discontents Revisited. I am also delighted to introduce Glenn Hubbard, Russell L. Carson, Professor of Finance and Economics. And as many of you know, Dean Hubbard has shared recently that he will be stepping down as the dean at the end of his, um, at the end of June. In his time as dean, Columbia Business School has been strengthened on every meaningful front. And I so appreciate, as I know many of you do, your comments this morning during the State of the Business School address. So inspiring, so engaging, much appreciation for everything that you've done. Thank you. solidified our, the standing of Columbia Business School as one of the world's most innovative business schools. His leadership has directly impacted the school's ability to continue to attract the, and add the most talented and diverse future leaders to our alumni community. Again, thank you, Dean Hubbard. An absolute honor. I'm sure this will be riveting and exciting. Let's get started. Great. I want to dive, I want to dive right in. I, I feel, Joe, like... Uh, I have shadowed you much of my intellectual life. I have learned an immense amount from Joe Stiglitz. His textbook with Tony Atkinson was the Bible of students in, in my generation in studying public economics. Uh, we both were the chief economic advisor to normal presidents of the United States <laughs> of, different, of different political parties. Um, and we both came of age in a profession where we could disagree, and we have, without questioning each other's integrity or each other's pursuit uh, of the truth uh, as we see it. So Joe, we're talking about globalization. You have just been to China. Uh, I was saying to Joe, I had just checked my Bloomberg on the way up. Uh, both sides say that uh, they are still talking uh, and they hope to uh, come to conclusion soon uh, on a deal. Oh, what were you hearing about tariffs? You know, in this country, we've been very focused on the bilateral trade balance, uh, some concern about intellectual property theft, and also China's 2025 strategy. What were you hearing on the Chinese side or from Americans there about the U.S.-China tariff war? Well, you know, you can, you can uh, break up the, the interaction, uh, the conflict, uh, into several components, and there's a lot of discussion of all the components. Uh, I think underlying uh, the the whole discourse are is the fact that uh, 40 years ago China's per capita income was about $150 per capita, and no one could have imagined it would go from that to being in PPP purchasing power parity, which is standard way economists, the largest country in the world, and that even an exchange rate, it will be, you know, if it's growing at even five, six percent, and we're growing at two, two and a half percent, it's going to be much larger than us, even in conventional measures within, you know, in 20, 25 years. And so this is both a competitive shock that we, you know, ne are just beginning to, to take a hold of. And it's a little bit of a security 
uh, national security, the people in the national security community have become anxious, uh, partly because in some of the areas where they know it's really important, like AI, uh, China is comparable to us, and in some parts of it probably ahead of us. So that, I think, colors the whole relationship. And then you go to very specific issue, issues. And here, I think, unfortunately, you were talking about um, uh, um, our, our uh, president. Um, he obviously didn't learn very much at Wharton. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or maybe he learned what they taught. We, we don't I know. don't know. We but, don't know. <laughs> but there's a problem. You know, one of the things you're supposed to learn is that bilateral trade deficits aren't what's important, that it's the multilateral trade deficit. The multilateral trade deficit is as much a matter of macroeconomic policy as anything else when there is a disparity between domestic aggregate investment and domestic savings. There's, we're going to have to import capital, and that's the flip side of a trade deficit. And uh, we've been saving too low, and they've been saving a lot. Um, and so the, the, uh, uh, the focus on you know, blaming China for our multilateral trade deficit is just wrong. And, you know, if any trade agreement, the most it would do is shift the countries from which we would be importing. So we might not buy clothes from China, we'll buy it from Vietnam. And probably the same company, it'll probably be <laughs> Yeah, yeah. A Chinese company was moved to Vietnam, so it's not going to make any difference. It's not going to come back yeah. to the United States, at least not, not very much. So part of the issue is that you have this very specific trade war going on about the trade deficit and the bilateral trade going on in the context of some really very deep and important issues. And, and that, well, let me ask you about those because to, to be devil's advocate for a moment, isn't President Trump absolutely right in calling out China as a bad actor? I remember I was one of the people that pushed George Bush to allow the accession of China, and the theory that I said to the president was that China was going to scale back state-owned enterprises. It would respect intellectual property. That has not happened. Query, is President Trump right in challenging China? You talked oh. about deep issues. I'm trying to elicit what you think yeah. those are. Um, well, I, I think one of the other things that's changed, that, that has changed our perspective, is that there was a widespread feeling, you know, when you were there and, and before, that trade engagement would lead to convergence and they would become not like, not, not a democratic country overnight, but more liberal, and, and we, there would be kind of convergence, you know, a weak, uh, weak convergence. And I think uh, there is a widespread sense, not only in the United States, but also in China, that President Xi is, represents a, a, a movement in the other direction, a, a more authoritarian uh, 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 politics than before. And I think that's colored some of this, because it's not that hope of the, the political gain from engagement that, that was the case probably when you were making that, uh, those decisions. But in terms of some of the specific issues, um, one of the, okay, let me just say, one of the big problems is that the WTO says that developing countries have different obligations than developed countries. And China, per capita income, is still a fifth of the United States. And in terms of the World Bank, which you know, says it's still a emerging market, it, you know, it's not a, a, a high income country, it's still a middle income country, and parts of China still have poverty in any normal sense of the term. I mean, they make a big deal that 740 million people have moved out of poverty, but that's using their definition of poverty. 
And if you went to these parks, the, you know, I've been to some of the remote, more remote parks of China, and they're living in poverty. You know, so, so they're still, in that sense, a poorer country. So this has been a problem that's gone, it was, was true in the Clinton administration. We can't wrap our heads around it being a very large but middle income country. So the, the rules of what are applying to middle income countries are different from those of rich countries. And we say, well, but they're very big. And they say, well, we're still not developed. And this is the way the conversation has gone for well, can 25 we, years. Can we make globalization work? And as if, if it's the case that the two leading countries have very different value systems about the role of the market in the economy, can we make a traditional WTO globalization work? Do we, we have the right rules for that game? Or is, will globalization unravel? Well, I, I would put it. Uh, the following, there's still important gains from trade, uh, even when countries differ a lot in values. But it's more difficult to make it work, and, and the WTO framework has problems. Let me just give you one example with Europe, or two examples with Europe, where, where we're uh, having uh, tensions and have had tensions for a long while. Uh, Europe, uh, Europeans are much more worried about GMO, uh, genetically modified foods. And uh, almost all American agriculture is mixed with gen genetically modified. We, we have organic things, but we don't have non-genetically modified wheat. So you know, if you're eating wheat, you're eating GMO. So the problem is because Europeans worry about GMO, if it's labeled GMO, they won't eat, they won't buy American wheat. So America says it is a trade barrier to, lay, to, to require disclosure of GMO. But Europe says this is consumer preferences. You know, how do you have an open society and transparent mm -hmm. if you don't label? So that's an example where our view, I mean, our, our, not my view, but our USTR's view oh, fair trade is non-disclosure, and Europe's view is disclosure, a really very basic mm -hmm. principle. We're going now through um, another uh, very difficult issue, and that has to do with the tech giants, with Europe. And Europe has ha been much more sensitive about privacy <coughs> concerns. And uh, some uh, market competition issues than the United States is. And so they've been taking a number of actions. Uh, they, they have what they call the EPDR, the, 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 uh, uh, the European uh, Data Protection uh, Regulation. Um, they've, uh, uh, Germany has uh, instituted an action against Facebook saying that the way that they framed it doesn't give people a choice. And, they're abusing their dominance in that market and have said, you know, you can't do that. Uh, they've attacked Google on a couple cases with conflicts uh, of, of interest. Um, and we haven't been taking actions. And, you know, we haven't seemingly had the same concern about privacy, although California, I don't know if anybody here is from California, but California has begun to discuss some of these issues. So that's an example that we're facing. Uh, now, the problem is, in the case of China, it's much worse. <laughs> and so I, what I'm trying to do by talking about Europe is to make us realize that the difficulty when there are different values of getting a level playing field, but when you don't recognize privacy at all, and surveillance is a basic part of your political system, and gathering big data is um, you know fundamental to the way right. your politics work, and data, big data, is very big for AI. They're going to have a competitive advantage, and, or they may have. There's some dis debate about that, but at least a lot of people think the surveillance gives them big data. Big data gives them a big advantage, 
And mm -hmm. how do we have a level playing field here yeah. on, on trade? One other example that, that you know, goes more, uh, beyond AI in, um, uh, in drugs. Uh, big thing now is DNA and getting big data on DNA. Uh, I don't know if it's true, the story is they asked 100 million children to give their spit in one day, and you got a sample of 100 million 150 million DNA. Yeah. T statistics will be good. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and we can't yeah. do that kind of uh, we can't do that kind of thing. Yeah. You can imagine what what parents will be saying yeah. in here if, if we tried uh, that kind of thing. Well, let me let me shift gears a little because we're talking about globalization. You raised Europe as well to globalization and populism. So globalization has gotten the bad rap, at least from politicians in much of the world is fanning the flames of populism. And it's true, you've seen trade blamed in the United States. You see this as an issue in Brexit with the UK and the European Union. You see this with the Yellow Vest movement in, in France. Is it fair to blame globalization? What, what's really at root here? Yeah, so I think what's really at root is that large segments of our society have not done very well. You know, that's the fundamental problem. And you know, 90% Stagnating, having stagnating income, and and uh, so uh, you know, life expectancy in the United States is uh, in decline for the third year in a row. You know, we're making the innovations to extend life, but our health delivery system and other aspects of it are resulting in in a shorter life expectancy. And life expectancy now in the United States is lower than in even many uh, less advanced countries. So, and that, I talked about that as a symptom of something going wrong. So that's the fun, that is the problem as I see it. Um, and the disparity between what was promised from a whole set of policies of which globalization was one, financialization was another, and what was delivered is that, that incongruity it, it gives rise uh, to anger. Now, what is the role of uh, globalization in this? Um, well, you can look at it in a couple of ways. One of them is there are some countries that are even more exposed to globalization, more open, who've managed these problems well. So what I say is it's not globalization itself, but it's how we manage that internally. You know, how do we, the, the, the idea that most economists uh, would say is that globalization increases the size of the pie but economists always pointed out that as it did that, it, if there weren't offsetting actions, it would make the pie more unequally distributed. That it would lower wages of unskilled workers. So it wasn't, uh, it was predicted that globalization would make people, significant segments worse off unless we did something and we didn't do anything. Now, you also have to ask, you know, putting it in perspective, even if there had not been any globalization, we would have had most of these problems. Because most of these problems also would have been generated by advances in technology. Isn't that the bigger deal? It's the bigger deal, but the way I would put it is globalization has compounded the problems that already would have existed with technical change. They would have been losing jobs. There would, you know, we call it there's something called skill bias technical change. So, so there are these tensions going on, and there's some other forces of increased monopoly powers and you know, lots of things going on, all of which are contributing to the uh, uh, miseration, you would say, of large parts of the, of the country. But then globalization is adding insult to injury. And this is where probably the politics come in. People are not going to say, I can't manage technical change. People want to think that they are capable of handling advances you know, that, uh, in, 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 in the technology. You know. But it is easy, particularly with demagogues or politicians to frame and say, you know, we could have, you could have done it, 
if it only had if, if it hadn't been for these unfair trade agreements and if it hadn't been for migration. So blaming others is an easy way of shifting attention away from what I would view as our own failures. Well, you know, in economics, as you said, we always remind people that free trade still is a good idea. I can see on the faces of people here that economics was their favorite subject <laughs> in college. <laughs> and inevitably, for technological change or uh, trade, probably their professor said, as you did, that the gainers could compensate the losers. It's not Pareto improving, but, but we, could, we could do it. But we haven't, as you said, so what should we do? So if we've got these forces of technological change and globalization unraveling the well-being of many, whether it's the United States, United Kingdom, wherever, what should politicians be doing about it? Well, uh, you know, uh, it, it's easiest to begin by saying what we should have done 40 years ago. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, but that gives you a little grain of, you know, we should have remembered that, what you just said, that we need to help people move from the jobs that are being destroyed to new jobs. Um, so there are several parts of this. One is, these are called active labor market policies, where you try to help people move from old jobs to new jobs. They have a mixed record in the United States, but in other countries, they have a much better record. And they only work when you have jobs. So if you have a 10% unemployment, they're not going to work. And if you don't have training programs to train people for the jobs that exist, they're not going to work. But other countries have managed to figure out this part out. A big problem that, I don't know where you feel about this, Glenn, but uh, uh, in the economics profession for a long time, there was a doctrine that people should move to the jobs and not jobs to the people. That you should think about where is the best place to locate jobs and then have the people move to them. And that was a view that really ignored the fact that there are significant costs to mobility. And that, um, you know, one way of thinking about that in reverse is to say one of the reasons plants located in these particular places in the rural sector. Uh, in some of the, in the Midwest and some of the South, was that wages were lower. The fact that wages were lower was evidence that there were mobility costs. <laughs> if there were no mobility costs, they would have moved out of there, and wages, you know, our standard model has wages the same everywhere, you know, adjusted for cost right. of living. Um, but that, that wasn't the way the world was then. And now that the, the factories have moved out, they're stuck there with low wages. Now, there's a whole sociology literature and an economics literature trying to understand what are the impediments to labor, you know, to mobility. Um, and some of these we can do something about. Well, should we subsidize mobility? Yeah, I think, I think we should. But I also think that we also should subsidize or encourage what I call place-based uh, industrial policy. You know, it's, it's destroying community. There is a, what we would call it human capital, social capital in a community, and destroying that community is costly for our society. So we ought to take advantage of that, some of that social capital and help move, move uh, or try to find <coughs> employment opportunities in these areas. Some countries, again, have done this better than others, and they're you know, their successes and failures, Manchester, which was the textile capital of the UK, has become, uh, with the help of the UK government, uh, uh, not only a university center with a lot of students, but also a music center. You know, and there was nothing to predict that it would become a music center, uh, but it has been. You know, so, so they've, made, they've, they've found something else to do. Um, and that, that may, you know, lots of tourism and things mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, that's not an answer. You know, I come from Gary, Indiana, uh, and... Uh, that's, by the way, to Paul Samuelson, two Nobel laureates from <laughs> Gary is not too bad. <laughs> uh, but we are competing with the 
Detroit for uh, what was the most devastated industrial city. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I go back, I, I've gone back, uh, I did a, 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 a little film on, uh, a documentary on, on globalization, and I used Gary as a, as a, a case study and it was, you know, it, 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 when people saw the film, they were just, you know, devastated by by what had happened, and you can uh, you could see it in the whole visage of the city. Yeah, for the audience has benefited this morning when I talked about um, the trip of in, MBA students to Youngstown, as much with the same spirit of yeah. watching a community uh, go down. There's a book I would commend to you as well called Janesville. Yeah. That's Paul, former House Speaker Paul Ryan's constituency. It was written by a Washington Post reporter about how a series of events in the world, not incompetence of people of Janesville or of ordinary workers, uh, put a town into a, a tailspin. When you said 40 years ago, I was thinking, you know, you and I were part of that 40-year arc, too, of people who were sitting in chairs and didn't do something about this. And I guess the question is, is part of the anger that many average people feel toward elites, whether they're elites that are Democrats or Republicans, is part of this that people felt looked through and ignored during this period, that we all thought we were raising GDP on average and calling it a day? Yes, I think that is part of the, the anger. I mean, I, I, uh, <laughs> I feel like I was raising some of these issues and 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 and, and Larry and, Summers and, attacked him, so that was the yeah. and saying that you know this was not the time to be cutting capital gains tax at the top. Uh, that was me. That was a, he's being very polite, but, he, uh, uh, but actually, Larry Summers was he, he also. Was, he was arguing. on that, that was, I was thinking yeah. more in, inside yeah. the Clinton administration. We had a very big uh, fight in '95 yeah. over that, and, and because it, it was in that period, you were beginning to see the data on inequality showing up, and uh, that we needed to attack some of the. We we had a big fight over. Uh, there are a lot of brownfield sites in some of our cities, and I wanted to re revive the cities, and, and everybody, you know, and so we were, our, and, that, and Treasury was saying, oh, great idea, but where's the money? And, you know, I came up with ways of doing it, but basically there wasn't the commitment to do these things. And uh, there was some of this argument that uh, trade is only one-sixth of the problem. So let's not even think about that, you know, too small mm -hmm. and, and just not a focus uh, on, on these issues. You mentioned, let me just yeah. say, One of the reasons was, I think, a longstanding, you know, and, and in both parties, sense of what's called trickle-down economics. You know, famously, uh, Kennedy said, a rising tide lifts all boats. And uh, you know, I often tell my students, I wish it were true because the tide has risen, but some of the boats got dashed in that rising tide. And so I think that belief that was widespread why, why that, that somehow everybody would be lifted up automatically sort of meant that they weren't focusing on what was really going on, which was significant segments were not being, were actually being going down. Not yeah, well, let, me, let me ask you about another trade issue, and that's the United States and Europe. So unlike China, where you have different value systems, we're talking about mature industrial democracies. Uh, the United States says Europe is a problem in this regard. What, how should we think about the European-US trade issues? How serious are they? I, I think, uh, I mean, this is one of those things where, where uh, uh, Trump has actually just raised a, a red herring. Um, you know, he says, uh, vastly unfair trade. And I don't, the data uh, is something like uh, their tariffs against us on average are around 3% and ours against them are like 2.9%. I mean, you know, it's sort of, there is a little difference, but it's because of the different composition of what we're importing and exporting. And, and if you've looked at non-tariff barriers, they're probably more important, and we don't know which way those go. 
I think what is uh, the animus, the motivation behind a lot of this is, I mean, it's really interesting. Uh, for some reason, Trump is uh, obsessed by cars. And, um, and he doesn't like it that Mercedes and BMW are doing very well. And they have good engineering, and you know they're they're going to be facing a problem. They're they're not uh, going electric as fast as uh, we have been doing, and so I think you know mm -hmm. there 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 is a a real problem going forward. But in terms of engineering, they've been really good, and I think um, the this idea that they're really you know uh, is a is a trade problem there. It's just uh, not true. And particularly, a lot of these European cars are made in the United States. And so we don't even know when you buy a, a, a car, a Mercedes or a BMW, you don't know whether it's an American Mercedes or, you know. It, uh, and one aspect of this that's been quite interesting, uh, because of the trade conflict, uh, uh, there have been discussion of BMW moving out of the United States because it gets parts from the United from China mm -hmm. and then exports the cars back to China. So the question is, if it's, you know, if there are these frictions in two way, uh, if it, and and a lot of its sales are in China, let's make it, it's thinking, you know, let's make the cars in China or in Vietnam and, and get out of this. Uh, area of friction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very interesting. Right now, we have just had a jobs report in the United States. It was very healthy. The stock market is extremely high. Where are we in the macro cycle in the U.S. and globally, in your view? Well, uh, globally, uh, most uh, forecasts are that 2019 is going to be slower than 2018, and 2020 is slower than 2019. And uh, the two big ingredients in the slowdown are uh, China, uh, partly because of the trade war, but I think partly because uh, they're having problems uh, figuring out a um, way of uh, sustaining uh, growth. They've had a very uh, credit debt driven growth model and they know that there are risks. Their, their debt GDP ratio is really high. You probably know the number, but I, I can't recall it right now. But it, anyway, it's much higher than almost any other country. Right. That, and no one with a ratio like that has had a story ending well. So yeah. that, that we know. So they know that. So, you know, my model is a little bit of uh, China is like uh, 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 a kid trying to, uh, uh, somebody driving a car with one foot on the brake and one foot on the accelerator. And, uh, you know, it pushes the accelerator down, the car goes too fast, and he puts on the brake, and then the, it goes too slow, and then he pushes on the accelerator. And so what, what's happening is they have one way of getting the economy to grow that they know about, which is credit. And then the credit numbers get very high, and they say, oh, we're, we're, we're having too much credit. And then they put on the brakes on the credit, and then the economy slows down. And they say, oh, we can't have so, so growth, and they go back. So they've been doing that now for a couple of years. And uh, you know, they need to have another growth model, another way of generating growth. And there are some uh, that just, you know, they need public investment in in environment, in urbanization. Um, they have a lot of infrastructure, but not, not urban mm -hmm. infrastructure, public transportation, um, health. Uh, so th there are lots of bases of growth that they could have, but they haven't focused, they, they haven't figured, figured this out. So China is going to be probably slowing down and be a little bit volatile. And then Europe, has a real problem. I think, uh, you know, I've written a book, I, I think the euro is, is the problem of Europe. They have a single currency and haven't the institutions to make a single currency work. Because lack of a fiscal union? What, what, what's your... Yeah, they, they, 
when you have a single currency, you take away uh, two adjustment mechanisms, interest rates and exchange rates. And then they tell countries that if your economy goes down, uh, you, your revenues go down, you can have deficits greater than 3%. And so they have a fiscal contraction. So you have a monetary, you have a problems on the monetary side, and exchange rate side, and then you have to have a fiscal contraction. And so that is both an economic problem. Italy's had 20 years of stagnation, but it's now becoming a political problem. And uh, in which you, Europe is being blamed for Italy's problems. And that's partly correct and it's partly not correct. But the, the real point I'm trying to make is that uh, the euro has really constrained growth. And the one country that has the potential of, of growing more of stimulus is Germany. And Germany is growing at like a 0.8%. And Germany says, what's wrong with that? You know, they're, they're saying, you know, our people are prosperous. Not everyone, but, <laughs> uh, you know, we have to, we're, we're living in a new world. Why grow at 3%? Just, you know, accept 0.8%. They really have, their, their aspirations have changed. So the engine, the po potential engines of, Italy can't, can't do anything, and Germany won't do anything. So Europe is, is going to be growing slowly in 2019 and 2020. And that leaves, you know, the, the United States. Now, my, my view on the United States is that I think no country that was as close to full employment as we were in December of 2017, ever undertook as big a stimulus as it undertook in December and January. It, you know, that, that, that really, uh, not only did we have a huge uh, deficit, uh, increase in the deficit with the tax bill, but then, we eliminated, the, there was a, a expenditure uh, deal, mm -hmm. and so we increased spending. And those two together added a significant amount to, uh, you might say, gas to the engine, uh, when we were already close to full employment. And uh, the fact that we haven't had inflation has been, for economists, uh, an interesting discussion, because um, it used to be this concept of the Phillips curve, when your unemployment gets down, you get inflationary uh, pressures. But I think the one view is that we have, I don't want to call it disguised unemployment, but we have a lot of people who would have liked to join the labor force, but over the decade from 2008 to 2018, uh, were discouraged, uh, or could only get part-time jobs, or you know, and now we're we're drawing them back in the labor force. At some point, that reaches a limit. Now we could bring over the longer term a lot more people in the labor force if we had better childcare, better family policies. Um, you know, we we have much lower labor force participation of women than your, some European countries do. Uh, we aren't very good about labor force participation of older people. Um, so there are many things that we could do to uh, increase our labor supply uh, without migration. But we aren't likely to do those, and we won't do those in the short run. So I think most economists think that sometime in the not too distant future, we will be hitting that labor supply constraint and that we'll hit other bottlenecks and that we'll see inflation creep up. And that's why, uh, I don't know, I'd like to hear your view on this, why the discussion about the new uh, appointments to the Fed have become of such concern. 
because that's the point where you need the Fed not to pour more, uh, lower the interest rates and, and to stimulate the economy more, but to sort of keep the economy in balance. I mean, that, that was mm -hmm. traditionally the role of monetary policy and why people thought it was so important to have at least some degree of independence of the Fed. So it wasn't being used for political purposes to overheat the economy as you go into an election. You know, that is the whole origin of, of the debate about an independence of Fed. And the degree of independence differs across countries, but the, the worry of, of a political leader being too short-sighted and just focusing on let's get more jobs in the short run and worry about the inflation in the long run has really been the, was, has been the impetus for uh, some degree of independence. Well, let me press you on that because uh, it's true the president seems to have a fascination with a pizza executive to be Fed governor, <laughs> but, uh, but he's not alone. On the left, what about modern monetary theory? Isn't oh. that the solution to all our problems? Yeah, no, I, uh, uh, I, I, the, the point is modern monetary theory is being discussed at the wrong time. It should have been discussed back in 2008 and 10, where we had a lot of scope for expanding. I still think there, there's more scope. There is some scope. And I, as I said before, there's more scope in the long run, because I think we can bring in, and it would be good for our society if, if we brought more women into the labor force, if we brought more of the older people in the labor force. So I do think that there's more scope for expanding aggregate supply. Um, but uh, in the short run, I think the scope for that is, is, is limited. And I don't know where that boundary is, but I am worried that, you know, that we will be hitting that boundary sometime in the not too distant future. It always brings tears to my eyes when Joe says the word supply, because I don't hear that that often. So, so I want to make a pivot because you and Bruce Greenwald have taught one of the most successful, if not the most successful course at Columbia Business School on globalization, why did you do it? What are the topics that you touch on? Uh, give people a sense of what the MBA students are learning in this area. Yeah, so uh, Bruce and I have been uh, good friends for a long time, and he helped recruit me uh, to, to Columbia. And uh, uh, I can't quite remember the origins of the course, but it, it, it was a, a, around uh, 2001 when I was, uh, um, oh. It's your phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Bruce. <laughs> How do I, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, uh, I was uh, working uh, on globalization at, at the time. I'd just come from the World Bank. And uh, uh, I just was just finishing my book, Globalization and Its Discontents, um, and reacting a little bit to the way globalization was being managed by the World Bank and the IMF. Um, and uh, Bruce was interested. I'm not quite sure why Bruce was interested in it. Uh, Probably just but, to take but, but, the opposite of whatever you wanted to do, yeah. is my guess. But so uh, that is part of the interesting thing about, you know, Bruce and I do not see, are not politically aligned exactly. Yeah. Uh, Bruce and I are closer to being politically aligned. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, it was uh, in the analytics of what are the issues we could agree uh, almost completely. Um, and, you know, th there was a discussion about, uh, you know, the role of, that we've just had about the role of technology versus the role of globalization and some of the forces going on. Uh, it, it's been really interesting because we were talking about some of these adverse effects 20, yep. and not 18 years ago and uh, giving this course when in 
Europe, we, f we first gave the course in Europe and uh, when, when the, the cor there was a global MB. Uh, mm -hmm. The London program, yes. The London, London program. And this was a big difference between America and Europe at the time. Um, Europe, Asia, most of the rest of the world was really obsessed with globalization. And uh, my book, you know, did okay in the United States, but it sold a million copies abroad. So it was it was it was really a a, uh, uh, a topic of uh, really great interest abroad. So as a global MBA program, it it, it drew it, it was really fun teaching because we got people also at one point we the Hong Kong was involved mm -hmm. and and, uh, and we got students from all over the world and that made the course uh, a really fun course to teach because you got students. You know, if, if I talked about intellectual property, I could talk about who was the real discoverer uh, of the airplane. And uh, there would always be a Brazilian in the audience <laughs> who would know that it wasn't the Wright brothers. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's always fun to have this kind of global audience where you have knowledge from, you know, the, for, that, that uh, people have, you know, and that I had gleaned from, you know, have being at the World Bank, but it was really, really fun, and to see the different perspectives that people had uh, of these issues. Now, Bruce and I didn't always agree on all the policy responses, but there were a couple of them that uh, we uh, uh, argued for, and um, uh, we agreed on, but unfortunately, no one else in the world uh, yeah. And one of them is uh, creating a global reserve system. Um, what the idea would be, was that you wanted that, to use SDRs, yeah, yeah. It, it was, it was special a, drawing rights in the IMF. That uh, um, when there's a shortage of global aggregate demand you know, over the whole world, one of the ways you could d deal with that is create global money, and the IMF actually has a vehicle for doing it, and we say we could do it that way, or we had some other ways of doing it. But it, it's like MMT, but, but it's, it's like creating... That's why I didn't like that idea either, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> it, it's, it's creating a global, giving uh, purchasing power to countries, especially developing countries, in order to allow them to develop more. So creating a global public good. Um, but the idea was that no matter how you thought about spending it, it was a way of addressing the deficiency of global aggregate demand. And remember, for a, a long period, uh, 2008 through about 2016, there was a big deficiency in global aggregate demand. I want to have a last question. I'm saying that so you start thinking of questions for Joe. You know, there was a time when, if you taught principles, or both of us have written principles books, you had uh, sections on capitalism versus socialism that kind of went out of favor because it was settled. It's it's no longer settled. How do you feel about what looks like mainstream political candidates uh, officially saying they're running on a socialist platform? Well, I think, you know, words mean different things at different times. So uh, what people meant by socialism uh, 50 years ago, 75 years ago, was uh, government ownership of the means of production. You know, that's what people meant. Uh, when uh, AOC talks about democratic socialism, uh, Democrats or, or Bernie Sanders, none of them are talking about government ownership of the means of production. What they're talking about is uh, some version of ensuring health insurance for everybody, some way of making sure that everybody can afford college without getting into grinding debt. Uh, some way of having a mortgage market that doesn't collapse on us like the 2008 mortgage market, some version of a retirement insurance program uh, 
where there aren't the conflicts of interest that have been such a source of, uh, of, of debate. And some way of making sure that um, the unemployment rate for young people in minorities is in four or more times that of the national average. So I mean, uh, things like that, that, you know, I wouldn't use the word socialist to describe it. I would just say, you know, it's a progressive agenda. And a lot of the response to a, a, a lot of the young people say, we don't understand the word socialism, but if that's what socialism is, we're in favor of it. You know? Okay, so we've gone from Stalin to free stuff, and now the floor is open to all of you. Uh, sir? I don't know if we have a microphone. And... Uh, thank you for... Uh... I am from Think that uh, one of or of these countries is a really developed country and full of democracy. Well, which developing countries are the most successful? In a nutshell. <laughs> so, I mean, I think the East Asian countries collectively have been the most successful uh, ever. And, and by that I mean, you know, their per capita income over a span of 40, 50 years increased 10, 20 fold. You know, and the growth rates that have never been seen ever anywhere. And so, um, you know, those, without a doubt, those, those in just narrow economic terms. And some of them, you know, like Korea, have made a transition from a military dictatorship to a democracy. You know, every demo democracy has often had problems, but, but it's a democracy. Uh, Taiwan has made a transition. Uh, so I would say, you know, collectively, those are the countries that have been uh, the most successful. There are uh, a few poorer countries that have had high growth rates uh, for a long period of time. We often don't uh, give them recognition. Botswana, Namibia. Uh, have been, you know, both successful, very small African countries, but have managed to in grow it at the rate of six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent. Um, Ethiopia, over the last uh, 15 years, has grown an average rate of 10 percent. So, you know, w w there, there are some real successes out there, beginning from very low bases, so they're still not, you know, like like China, which has become really big. Sir, sure. what is your view of the Paris Climate Agreement and the Trump administration's decision to withdraw? Well, I think you know the Paris Agreement uh, was uh, is is very important. I mean, I, let me just say, I, uh, I was on the IPCC uh, panel in in. Uh, Report 1995. Looked over the evidence, and I followed it since then. And I am very convinced that the evidence is overwhelming. And I think 99.9% .9 of the physicists, scientists who look at it, say the same thing. So it, it is a real concern. And uh, since our report in 95, what has become clear is that there were it occurred faster than we thought in 1995. And there was something that we discussed in 95, but there wasn't evidence then, but now there is evidence and, and theory. And that is that global climate change is associated not only with warming on average, but greater volatility in temperatures, greater swings. And those have really large consequences. You know, the hurricanes, the fires, uh, Cyclones. These are very big weather-related events. The United States 
has had uh, a small percentage of the deaths, but 80% of the global uh, property damage, partly because we're the richest country. But we've, so we are among the countries that are suffering. You know, it, back in the, in the beginning, people said, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're not like the tropical countries that we're going to be hit hardest by climate change. And the part of the argument was Maine would be swimmable. And, and, and you know, so what, what's the problem? Uh, Minnesota would be a, a nicer place to live. But, uh, uh, but what that forgets is the volatility, you know, that forgot about all these things, the frost and the, uh, and the extreme weather event. And we lost close to 2% of GDP in one year alone from natural disasters. So this is a big thing. So to go answer, the Paris had a big problem because they knew they could not get anything through the US Congress. And so they had to frame, they wanted, you know, most of the world would have liked to have had a binding agreement. But they knew they couldn't get anything through Congress, so they, they knew they had to have voluntary agreements. But peer pressure is, it works, and, and, and the, their view was that if enough people could get on board, the business community would become convinced that this is the future. If the business community got convinced that this was the future, they would start adopting green technology. Once they adopted green technology, it was in their business interest to make sure that their governments responded by making sure that there weren't bad actors in there. So the whole theory of Paris was to create the momentum that would make a voluntary agreement work. And I think the fact that in spite of the threat of US to withdraw, no one else is withdrawn. And um, cities, states, and businesses in the United States have said, we're going ahead. So I think that's testimony that that particular model uh, is holding. And I, I, obviously, I think uh, in uh, 2020, uh, we will have to rejoin it. Yeah, I would just add as a sidebar, the, <laughs> the real leadership here is coming from the business community. There is not a business leader in any part, even of extractive industries, that's not totally focused on this. Yes? the immigration, um, depending on the countries. Uh, so how do they, how is that uh, looks like and how does it affect the globalization in general, especially in terms of the services also? Yeah, well, uh, it, it's no, uh, it doesn't take a lot of insight to say that migration has become a political issue uh, everywhere <laughs> in the world, both in Europe and the United States. It, it, it's become, an issue, even when it's, where it's not an issue. By that I mean, you know, the allegation that we were being flooded by Mexican migrants was raised just when the statistics on Mexican migrants were that there were almost no migrants. In fact, the, the, the reversal uh, was occurring. So, so uh, it was it was not an issue, but became a political issue. Um, the from an economic point of view, if you were to ask what would raise global G GDP more, free migration of capital or free migration of labor, uh, the answer is free migration of labor. But capital, when it moves, if it moves in a volatile way, causes a problem. But if it moves in a steady way, there's no, there's not that much emotion. It's a little bit about Chinese capital, and, you know, but, but in general, we don't worry about the label about where the capital comes from. Labor migration you, are people, and you have to integrate them into your society. And there are uh, almost all, you know, that process of integrating people into a society it, it takes time. And it's not easy, it takes resources. And so uh, that has been part of the, uh, the, the agitation 
that in some places they felt that the magnitude was larger than their ability uh, to absorb. But uh, I guess one more thing I would say, you know, migrants bring both demand and supply. And so the argument that, that you know, what it does to, to incomes is much more complicated than is usually asserted. And, and we as a country, you know, we, the United States believes, we've been better off as a result of migration. I, I, th I think there's unambiguous the case that we've benefited from migration. Yeah, and unfortunately, we conflate two issues that are very different. One is very high-skilled immigration, the other is low-skilled. So 40 to 50 percent, depending on the year of Columbia Business School students, are not Americans. <laughs> my dream would be that each of them live and work in my country, not because I'm a good person, but because I'm fundamentally selfish. Their talent is great. That's not going to crowd out the wages of high-skilled Americans. Having said that, low-skilled immigration will put pressure, downward pressure, on the wages of low-skilled Americans. So that is a political issue. And then the question is, is the right answer to talk about immigration, to talk about other forms of compensation? But that's where the political rubber meets the road. Yes, sir? Hi, Charles Okochu, uh, MBAR 2018. I have a two-part two question. The first question is, what is your view of uh, digital assets like Bitcoin and it, its potential impact on the future of globalization? And my bonus question is, uh, we just had a yield curve inversion. I wanted to get your views on uh, potential impact on the U.S. economy. Uh, yield curve inversion was oh, the second part. Yeah. So the first, Bitcoin, I, I um, uh, got a, a little... Uh, uh, notoriety on this because I was doing a, a, a television interview on a uh, on my book uh, Globalization and Discontents Revisited and I wanted to talk about my book and the reporter wanted to talk about Bitcoin and uh, uh, it was when the Bitcoin was getting up to ten thousand dollars and so I responded uh, in a, 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 a little bit short uh, and said uh, it ought to be banned and uh, <laughs> there you have it. Done and done. Okay. And and that got uh, in the Bitcoin community, uh, that got me a little bit of notoriety. But the point I was trying to make is we have until now a pretty good currency called the U.S. dollar. I mean, maybe ruined by some people, but but we have <laughs> we, we 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 have a good currency. It's a store of value. Low transaction cost. Um, you know why? Why do you want another currency? Well, uh, especially a currency that's so volatile, going up and down. Well, it's exactly because it's a cryptocurrency. What does cryptocurrency mean? It's secret. Now, what are we doing in our banking system? We're working very hard to get more transparency, to stop money laundering, to stop the use of money for terrorism, to stop the money, you know, use of money for all these nefarious activities. And it's, you know, it's an enormous burden on the banking system. Uh, and as we're doing that, we're opening up a huge door for illicit activities. Why should we do that? Uh, I don't think there's any social value and I actually think there are mechanisms by which we can curtail it. So I'm not a big uh, uh, Bitcoin fan. Um, so, the, so what? But now, but before it, but yield curve inversion? Yeah. So the yield curve inversion is usually meant, uh, it's a forecast. You know, that, that if people think that future interest rates are going to be low, then the long-term interest rate, which is the product of the short-term, plus or minus some risk aversion, but um, we'll, we'll have this inversion, okay? So what does it mean that you expect the interest rate in the future to be low? Well, typically it means that the Fed, or the monetary authorities elsewhere in the world, are going to be pushing interest rates lower. Why would they be doing that? Not because we're at full employment, and, and, but, but because we are, have a weak economy.
So that's why the yield curve, yield, yield curve inversion is usually thought to be symptomatic of a problem in the future. It's not that it's causing the problem in the future, but it, what it's saying is the market in the aggregate, it's aggregating the views of all the people in, you know, in our economy, the weight of opinion in the market is that the economy is going to be weaker going forward. Sure. Yes. Well, I just want to go back to the environmental question because, you know, we always talk about, uh, you know, the, the effect of trade and, and, and finding lower wages, that, uh, that labor arbitrage that we also talk about global trade, but there's also a massive environmental arbitrage. So to get around U.S., you know, uh, EPA laws or what, you know, you would source, you would make your chemicals now in different countries that had less. But, you know, are we getting to, a, well, now we're finding out that we're getting to a critical point with the earth, you know, getting hotter and it's going to be 2050 now that things start really going bad, according to the latest science. You know, have we had our head in the sand? Because we're also, the unintended consequences, we're bringing, a, a, you know, a billion people in China up to the middle class and in India, the same thing. So now they're going to, the demand is going to, for, for, uh, you know, cars and the demand for other polluting uh, things. Uh, is the genie out of the bottle now? And, and yeah. So should we, have, should we be having a different conversation? Yeah. So I mean, there are two parts of uh, the question. Global warming is a global public good, as we call it, or a global ba bad. You know, and it has to be dealt on a global level. Um, and uh, the increase in incomes in the emerging markets, including China, uh, are going to be associated with their consuming more goods. And that consumption of more goods is going to lead to more carbon. And, uh, but I think anybody, we all have to say that, you know, w those of us, you know, that we can't tell them, okay, we in the West, we in the United States and in Europe have this high standard of living and are uh, uh, to the world. You now have to stay less developed so that you don't pollute. I mean, that's politically, ethically unacceptable. So the reality is that uh, they shouldn't have the right to pollute more than we do. But the question is, how do we, given that, that, that they're going to be inevitably having a, a, a quest to have a higher standards of living, how do we, as a world, deal with this problem that if we continue to add carbon to the atmosphere, we are all going to suffer? Now, what China has told all the car companies in China they will all have to be electric uh, within a few years. They have basically told them, I've been in a meeting where the premier talked talk to Ford and, and other car companies and said, if, you know, we are going, we are not going to be allowing any production by Chinese companies or foreign companies of non-electric cars because we can't afford it, afford it in the sense of, Breathing and, and, and our global atmosphere can't afford it. So that's why it needs global cooperation. And it's going to be a challenge. We can't tell people they cannot grow. Uh, what we have to tell them is they can grow in a way that doesn't have carbon emissions. And we have to help develop the science by which that is done and global agreements including possibly cross-border taxes. That is to say, somebody that violates these rules will be punished, you know, it, it, this, which is what we did in the ozone-destroying gases. In the case of ozone-destroying gases, we said this is a global issue, and anybody that violated that agreement was threatened with uh, cross-border taxes. Yes, yeah, so our question uh, back there in the center. I'll, I'll, no. come you. I'll come to you next, if I, you go first. Yeah. 
No, we'll just go for it. You got the mic. How do you think the response to the 2008 crisis uh, impacted uh, increasing inequality and opposition to globalization around the world? Oh, I, I think it had uh, a big impact uh, in two ways. Um, at the very moment, you know, in the in the first in, in the United States, just to, uh, in the first three years of the crisis, 2009 to 2012, 91% of the increase in GDP went to the top 1%. So when Obama was talking about there's a recovery, 99% of the people didn't see the recovery. And that, you know, you were talking about the alienation between the elites and ordinary people. Every time he said that, I think it made people feel, you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, I think there was also some resentment of um, the fact that so many people lost their homes and their jobs. But none of the, but then the money all went to the banks. You know, you can discuss whether that was the right economic policy, but now I'm talking about the perception. It was felt to be inequitable, and none of the bankers who were responsible were held accountable. You know, there were a few mid level people that were charged, uh, you know, one. You know, uh, uh, really, one small banker here and another small banker there, but none of the people who were at the center of the collapse. And this was very different from what happened in the SNL crisis, where a thousand people went to prison. And you know, not that I like prison, but I, <laughs> but, but the, the notion, the the sense of lack of accountability, I think, contributed to to the general anger against the. The establishment. I mean, to add to what Joe said, a colleague of mine here, Chris Mayer, and I had a proposal in 2008 for a mass refinancing of home mortgages. I will go to my grave thinking if the country had done that, it's not just that the economy would have been different, but the politics would have been radically different. And I I'm supported gonna, the, 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 that. This you know. was one of the few times we were <laughs> together. Uh, I'm going to have to give you the last question, but others can hang around. I'm sorry, because we're going to be closing at 5.15. I'm going to give you the last question, because you can come up and ask Jeff. Any kind of yeah. comment you can make about uh, burgeoning sovereign debt in the United States and the Western world? I mean, it kind of speaks to your last point, I think. You know, the accumulation. Will the money class, I mean, 40 years ago, the debt markets would have never lived with this kind of deficit. Um, would you, do you have sovereign any debt. comments? Uh, Problem or not? Of U.S. debt? I think he's saying you, sovereign, sovereign debt, debt generally. in both Western Europe and the United States is just burdened. Well, can we live with this? Is this a crisis? No, it's not. Uh, uh, that's a quick answer, but I, uh, I've consistently said, said that, that um, you know, any firm, you look at the debt assets and you look at the liabilities. And debt is only one part of a country's balance sheet. And uh, that uh, uh, if you've borrowed money to build good infrastructure or education and technology, the country's stronger. Um, on the other hand, one, yeah. Yeah. One, <laughs> one, one has to remember, uh, to give you two, uh, both Ireland and Spain were countries that had low government debt before the crisis, very low government debt. What happened in the crisis, in both cases, Debt morphed from private debt onto government debt. Um, in the case of Ireland, it was at the insistence of the ECB. I thought it was a mistake, but they, they took it on. So the point I'm making is that in looking at the, you might say, the financial sustainability of a country, you need to look not just at the debt and assets of the government, but also the private sector, because if you have a financial uh, 
system that is uh, fragile, there is a high probability that that debt will move onto the public balance sheet. And so uh, I worry about some things, you know, that you aren't worrying about, but I'm, always, I'm not as worried about the, the public debt per se uh, in those countries where, where there are uh, uh, good institutions, you know, a, a good education, good road, good infrastructure. But if you're spending money for a vacation, then I do start to worry about it. One asset I do know is Joe Stiglitz is a great asset of Columbia Business School, the nation, and the world. I want you to join me in thanking my teacher, my colleague, my friend, Joe. <laughs>